Well, hey guys, it's uh, Dr. Drake 63 here, and uh, not here to talk about a black rifle today. Going to talk about a black powder rifle. This one is a Kentucky rifle. This one is uh, manufactured by Petersoli, which is uh, out of Italy, and uh, they they do fine work in Italy. I like the Invest Arms that I have quite a bit, and. Uh, this particular rifle uh, I picked up at Dixie Gunworks, who distributes uh, for Petasoli. There's other folks that do as well. I had long heard that Petasoli was kind of a, a higher end in the black rifle reproduction market, and uh, that Invest Arms was a little bit lower in terms of in terms of quality and so forth. Uh, although, as I'll show you later in this video, I don't find that necessarily to be true. But having said that, this is a very fine reproduction of a Kentucky rifle. And you might ask, what is a Kentucky rifle? What makes a rifle a Kentucky rifle? Well, actually, they're originally uh, from Pennsylvania, of, uh, not Kentucky. Uh, but somehow the name got picked up over time because they were used a lot on the frontier and so forth. And so uh, the Kentucky long gun, the Kentucky rifle, as well as, uh, uh, of course, the Pennsylvania rifle, which has an even longer barrel, some of them do. Now, these were actually <clears throat> takeoffs in terms of, in terms of uh, their design. Uh, the origins were actually from European hunting guns. I took this video in Paris when I was at the Louvre last year, and you can kind of see how ornate and show pony-ish these European hunting guns were a similar time period, black powder rifle. Uh, just a lot of stuff that you wouldn't find on an American rifle. One of the things that uh, we realized here in this country back in the early days, back before we were a country on the frontier, there wasn't a need for a lot of ornate inlays, uh, things of that nature. It was a tool. It was uh, designed as such. So you even saw a lot of them that didn't even have this uh, this patch box here that you see on the stock, a lot of them were just a plain wood stock. But uh, th this particular rifle uh, is something that uh, I've long coveted, probably going back to uh, to being a youngster and hearing stories of Davy Crockett and so forth. And more recently, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis and Last of the Mohicans, he carried a Kentucky long gun, in fact, had the, the nickname long gun. So, um, a lot of, lot of mythology about these out there. I know I, for a long time, believed that your average patriot carried one of these in the fight against the British. And in fact, uh, the British were carrying the brown bass, which was a musket, a smooth bore, and not a rifle. Uh, and uh, the American troops uh, under the Continental Army, George Washington, also carried muskets. They were uh, bigger caliber. They were quicker to load, the tolerances weren't as tight, and they weren't anywhere near as accurate as one of these guys. In fact, uh, the uh, effective range of a brown best was 50 or 60 yards, and somebody that knew what they were doing with a Kentucky rifle or a Pennsylvania rifle uh, was able to uh, uh, make good shots out past 200 yards even. So uh, this is uh, just a, a fine replica uh, there's things about it that, that already make me want a custom version, but you're talking about the difference between, say, $700 or so and getting into uh, a lot more money than that, two, 3000 to get a custom-built version of these. So not, not on my radar right now, uh, but uh, I might actually build a black rifle kit because now between this and the Invest Arms, learn a little bit about them. I'm kind of getting an idea of what I like what I'd change and mostly would like to put one together. Now this one is a percussion version. So you see right there you put the uh, number 11 percussion cap on, on the nipple there and uh, uh, basically uh, the original ones and versions going up through the uh, 1830s were flintlocks. I just didn't happen to want to wanna fool around with flintlocks at this point. Uh, and the additional powder and, and messing with the flints, but I definitely do want to go that direction at some point. So today we uh, we took this out and we shot it. We shot the Invest Arms. We shot a, muz a modern muzzle loader, uh, kind of a, a low end introductory gun that I bought my my son several years ago, and we just never got around to shooting it. But that uh, was a CVA Buckhorn, 
and uh, uh, modern sights, things of that nature, shooting a, a, a ballistic trajectile, a, a conical type bullet, more accurate than this. But this is something that uh, really the only uh, the only drawback and, and the only thing that's going to keep me from being more accurate with it are the fact that it's it's just 100% iron sights. Okay, this has a uh, a buckhorn style sight on the back. It's not adjustable except drifting for windage. Uh, from the factory, no adjustment needed for windage. We we're able to group these very nicely. Uh, however, for elevation. I'm going to have to find a way to uh, reduce the height of this site. It shoots low and uh, probably just a case of just filing it down to some extent and we'll figure out how much we need to do. But anyway, uh, these are really cool rifles. You've seen me do a lot of, uh, a lot of shooting with uh, semi-automatics, AKs, Galils, ARs, you name it. And uh, you know, I've been shooting holes in paper for a long time. But what I love to do the most is hunt. I like to take my time. I like to improve my, uh, my, my shooting ability, especially in a freehand kind of scenario. And um, uh, this definitely is a deliberate process. My, my son and I went to the range uh, over the course of three and a half hours. I probably shot 15, 16 rounds out of this. So uh, it's definitely something that if, uh, if, if your thing is, is uh, plinking a lot, then the black rifle's probably not for you. If you don't like getting your hands dirty, probably not for you. Uh, but getting back to my conversation about, uh, about the, 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 the colonials, the patriots, uh, Washington recognized, as did the British, just how doggone accurate these rifles were for their day. Washington employed these kind of on the flanks to harass the British. The British uh, knew when they saw a, a woodsman with one of these to give them plenty of, uh, plenty of space because quite frankly, you could shoot a Brit from a lot farther distance, probably three, four times as far a distance as you could with one of their firearms. Um, but uh, there was one battle that was, was kind of a big deal. It was a battle of Kings Mountain towards the end of the war and that was a whole bunch of frontiersmen with Kentucky and Pennsylvania style rifles and they knocked the tar out of the British so there is that but uh, uh, mostly uh, known for uh, being a tool of the American frontiersmen and uh, very cool very cool so I hope you'll enjoy watching shooting we're like I said compared to the invest arms uh, Hawken and uh, hope you'll enjoy so I've got this side by side with uh, the Invest Arms, the Kentucky rifle on the bottom. And what I like better about the Invest Arms is the quality of the wood. It's just a beautiful, uh, beautiful piece of wood that was used to make this stock. And uh, I love the finish on it. Kentucky rifles, just more of a basic thing. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, attention to detail, some of the things you'll see where the stock was inlet to uh, accommodate this brass piece. I would have done a better job, but then I got all day to make the thing. So uh, in comparing that to say what we see over here on the Invest Arms, the Invest Arms is a little bit better done. Now, how big a deal is that? It's an ornate piece out of this. Is it a huge deal? Not to me. What really matters to me is that it's got a good working lock and they both do. This particular one, the Invest Arms, has a set trigger. And here in the Kentucky Rifle, it's just a basic trigger. Uh, and kind of going down the rifle here, what I really think they did an awesome job on was the barrel. Very nicely done. And uh, would I say that it's better or worse than the Invest Arms? It's a good chance they're both made at the same place. I don't know. But they're both, uh, they're both fine looking rifles and uh, they both function beautifully. When you go to the range, expect to do some work. Expect to do some work. Ex expect that you're going to, to uh, need to use some tools at some point or another. Here, I don't even know if I can get the whole thing into the, into the frame, can I? So just some differences. You can 
take down this barrel off of the stock real easily with the invest arms. You just knock this peg out with a rubber mallet and then the, the barrel hooks in to the breech. And then here, a um, lot more work involved with taking the barrel off the Kentucky. Don't know why you'd want to, but uh, might make it easier to clean if you're gonna do a deep cleaning or something like that. We're just looking at the quality of the barrel one to the other. Um, I do just have the general impression that the, uh, the Petersole is a little bit better made. You're talking about carrying a lot of gun. I don't have a gun case that fits the Petersole, the Kentucky rifle. So I'm gonna have to get one. Just lots of fun, guys. Lots of fun. And now you know why they call it a long rifle. Well, now I'm going to show you why uh, you don't shoot 200 or 300 rounds at the range with uh, black powder. It's a very deliberate and systemic process. Uh, what you need to do, what I'm doing right here is, is pouring my powder into my measuring tool and uh, that would be a lot easier if I had a funnel screwed onto the end of that. Uh, but I didn't spill very much, got my back turned to the wind. And uh, you wanna make sure you put that powder down right away. Because if you forget, if you get distracted and you just put your patch and your ball down there, which I've done, uh, it's no fun. You've gotta spend a lot of time getting that out of there, either screwing into the the, the ball or whatever you have to do, uh, uh, such as taking the nipple off and forcing powder in just to get enough to get it out of there. But here I'm putting the patch over now and uh, I'm using uh, this tool, which first you use a short end to force it down. Got your 50 caliber ball going down there. And then you use a little bit longer to get it started real well. And then uh, I'm using a range rod as opposed to the rod that's on the rifle and uh, tamping that down and uh, it does take a little bit of force to get it down there and you wanna make sure that it's tamped down all the way. So now we're gonna go ahead and uh, put some eye protection and ear protection on because uh, these guys tend to go bang in a loud way. And I'm gonna put on the number 11 percussion cap. Now I have a tool for this, which makes it real easy, but uh, I'm just picking it out, little teeny tiny thing in my fingers. And uh, I figure, well, why use a tool when you can just go ahead and, and uh, I don't know, maybe just drop the thing on the table and start over? So uh, that's real slick. But anyway, uh, you're, you're going to seat that percussion cap on there. Now you're ready to shoot. Here's my second oldest son. He's taken his very first shots with the Kentucky rifle. And uh, he's not a bad shot either. Accuracy wise, uh, I was able to put my first four shots in about a two and a half inch group at 50 yards. And I'm not gonna complain about that. I think this rifle is as accurate as I'm capable of being. So I think uh, it's just a matter of practice, getting used to these sights and uh, make sure that uh, I get that elevation issue taken care of with the front sight. Wonderful rifle, fun to shoot, doesn't kick very much and uh, gotta say I thoroughly enjoyed shooting this firearm today, without a doubt. This is DR Drake 63 saying thanks for joining me today. I've included links to both Petter Soli and Dixie Gunworks in the comments section. Once again, thanks for watching. Carry on, guys.